Saints and mystics call it the great day of change, the hour of decision for mankind. We explain why as we continue to break down the book of Revelation and the sixth seal, next on Countdown to the Kingdom. Hello again, I'm Mark Mallett from the NowWord.com and Countdown to the Kingdom.com, and I'm joined by my colleague, Professor Daniel O'Connor in Albany, New York. Hello, Daniel. Good to be here as always. Thanks, Mark. You know, I always tell people where you're from, but never where I, I'm from Saskatchewan, Canada. And so the reason I don't say it is because most people just go, huh? <laughs> I had a Canadian friend back in seminary, and he, and he laughed at me every time I tried to say that that place so i don't try anymore that's right all i know is you live in an igloo yeah right? that's well that's right actually yeah. there's a half truth to that i don't know if i've ever told you the story of uh, there was this is true an american wrote me and he said mark he says i know you live in canada and uh, he says have you ever seen an igloo and uh, i said yes i have as a matter of fact but I can't remember which issue of National Geographic it was. So <laughs> that kind of that does it doesn't look like an igloo in the background, I guess. No, a little bit maybe. No, that kind of ended that conversation pretty quick. But um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so I live in Saskatchewan, in the middle of nowhere. It's kind of looks like if you want to know what it looks like up here, it's kind of like Kansas in Wizard of Oz. And it's so windy up here, we do see flying dogs and the occasional witch, which we just rebuke. So, it's <laughs> Well, that's fitting, because we're not in Kansas anymore, isn't that the saying? <laughs> Boy, are we not. The world... we gotta, I mean, I'm a city boy myself, so I look out and I can just see society mm -hmm. collapsing with my own eyes. Mark, you have to take, the, you have to, uh, take my word for it, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it's happening. Yeah, no, I trust, you know, we are out in the middle of nowhere, but uh, <clears throat> we do have a thing called internet here. In the internets, okay. And right. you and I have been following it, and it's really true. We are not in Kansas anymore. The world has we changed are not. so much. Um, you know, we're here at the sixth seal, and I mean, it's it, it's um, you might be dis you might have been, I don't know, maybe some people are a bit distressed at hearing all the quote bad news of the last several seals. First of all, it's not bad news. Why? Because remember the first seal. Remember that Jesus is the first rider, and he is completely in charge of everything that's happening, and he is allowing it mm -hmm. only because he knows that this. The opening of these seals is, yes, bringing the world to its knees. But when are you most open to grace? When everything's going swimmingly and all is well, or when you're on your knees? And we all know the answer to that question. You are most open to grace when you're on your knees. So these seals that we've gone through so far, feel free to take a look at our previous webcast if you need to review them, although we'll quickly run through them in a moment here, will bring the world to its knees. It will prime the world for an outpouring of grace like it's never seen before in history. And I'm very excited to share with you what that means as we get into the sixth seal. But Mark, maybe before we do that, we can run through just a few quickly, a few of the headlines to indicate what brought us here to the sixth seal. That, that's right. That, yeah, I think we should. And, and what you're looking at right now is a graphic that we have on our timeline at countdowntothekingdom.com. This graphic is a superimposition of a great storm. Uh, scripture speaks of it. Many seers have spoken of it. Um, this storm is kind of a wonderful template for showing us how the end times unfolds. And what we're approaching right now is not the end of the world, but we are approaching the end of an era. That is absolutely clear. And as you can see above us, the uh, Daniel just mentioned the first seal, the time of mercy, but we have the second, third, fourth, and fifth seal. And Daniel, why don't we just quickly, I mean, just quickly run through what these seals are and maybe turning to the headlines once again, just as a quick recap, before mm -hmm. we get to the eye wall of the storm, which is the most intense part where, you know, as you get closer to the eye wall of a hurricane, the winds get faster, it gets more chaotic, it gets destructive to the point where it's, you know, <clears throat> well, as we're going to find out, out. This is a spiritual climax, really, as what we're headed. So, Daniel, why don't we just start off with, with Peace Shattered? That is the second yeah. seal, and what we see in the headlines already. <clears throat> And these headlines that we're about to bring up here, you know, a lot of these things <laughs> have come into the news since we did our earlier webcast. So it's uh, it, it's becoming just 
more and more obvious by the day in front of our eyes that these seals are about to be opened. We're not saying, you know, we're not saying that they're entirely in the future. We're seeing the rumblings of the seals right now. You see here in front of your eyes that North Korea will sever contact with South Korea. You know, this is a major harbinger. What's going on with North Korea? And yes, we've been watching this for a long time, what's going on in North Korea, but it seems like there we're moving closer and closer to a real outbreak of conflict but it's not just any individual thing any individual country we're looking at it's this whole interconnected mess mm -hmm. frankly involving not only the koreas but iran and russia and china now and india it's looking more and more unavoidable that we are about to see a third world war that's right and we are paying attention to this in part on Countdown to the Kingdom uh, because several of the seers who we deem credible or who have a certain amount of approval already from their bishops or pe people who are high up in the church have spoken of a coming worldwide war or conflict. And so we're paying attention to them, North Korea being mentioned, China, uh, Russia, and America playing major roles. So that is the second seal, peace being taken away. Away, this obviously would impact the the economy. If you if you you know the economy is already like a house of cards, it's already beginning to collapse. A major conflict like this, according to St. John's div um, vision brings about our third seal, which is economic collapse. And so we can see this also, once again, amazingly, in the headlines. Mm -hmm. This is so recent here. I mean, this is just a, a week or two ago that th this is not some sort of conspiracy theory. This is as mainstream as it gets, the International Monetary Fund saying that this economic collapse will be even worse than feared. And this is not even considering the peace shattered aspect with second great depression you see now in front of your eyes unfortunately it's not going to just be another great depression it is going to be far worse and, and we see this right. mathematically and logically in front of our eyes look at the insane printing of money and this desperate attempt to pretend that the crisis isn't the, the way we're responding to coronavirus isn't destroying right. the economy when in fact it already has. And so as you can see behind us, we Daniel and I aren't, uh, we're not sitting here trying to read something that's not already happening in the world. Yeah. So, and we're already, of course, we're seeing um, the collapse, the social collapse happening, Daniel, all left and right all over the world. Oh, uh, yeah. And I don't need to look yeah. at the news at all to see that being, you know, a city boy. I can look, when we did the webcast, and you can take a look at it if you want, we won't bring all this all those headlines up again but you know i see i'm just in a little city i mentioned i didn't even realize in the, in the webcast we talked about this i think i said something about my city having hundreds of thousands it's got less than a hundred thousand all in new york and we've been seeing the number of shootings that you would expect from a chicago or something and i know that my city is just one example of cities all over the country and all over the world that are seeing peace that are seeing this social collapse this anarchy really it's right. not a stretch to say that we're seeing the beginnings of anarchy right now. Right. And part of that is the in the four seal, St. Uh, John speaks about uh, the sword, pestilence, and famine. And again, we are seeing famines of biblical proportions being spoken about. The world, uh, United Nations warning about this, the United Nations Food Organization. Um, and this is, folks, we're just going to say this. This is not just a famine in the third world. I think we in the West, it is coming toward us. You know, we are fed right now by three or four, oh, probably four um, uh, corporations, food corporations, massive global corporations that feed us. People, Daniel, don't even know how to plant gardens anymore. A lot of the knowledge that, you know, I hear about here on the prairies about how to store food and how to preserve food, that knowledge isn't there. And I'm actually thinking right now of a Protestant um, prophet, his name was John Paul Jackson, the late John Paul Jackson, who was very accurate and he had, he had many things that are consistent with what the Catholic prophets are saying. And he had visions of people tearing up asphalt in their cities in order to plant gardens. Well, you know, again, we're not saying this to scare you folks, but we can, we can see it again in the headlines. Global food chains are being affected not only by COVID, but by things like locusts and that type of thing. Well, we've got breakdown, famine, plague. We don't want to dwell on these things because we've talked about them, but we can't, you know, stop there. We have to mention, of course, the fifth seal. And we are seeing right now 
um, which is persecution, essentially. You, it's the martyrs crying from beneath the altar, crying out, and the Lord saying, there will be more. There's going to be more martyrs. And yet. you see it right there in, in chapter 6. It's quite clearly a reference to those being martyred. So please bear in mind, this is already happening in Asia under communist persecution. Yes. It's already happening in the Middle East and Africa because of uh, Muslim terrorism. We're already completely seeing the persecution there. But don't think that we're isolated from it in the West. <clears throat> it is coming to the West but I don't think, and this is my speculation, I think it's coming from the West, not through Islamic terror, although that'll be a part of Islamic terrorism. I think it's coming primarily by way of Western culture deeming the infallible Christian moral law to be hate speech. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and just look at what the Supreme Court of the most powerful government on earth just declared. It just decided to overrule natural law and divine law. And if we can't even say, you know, we can't even say that a man is a man and a woman is a woman anymore without that being deemed hate speech. That means that the persecution is at the very doorstep. That's right. That was a word in my own heart years ago. The Lord said, prepare. The second word was persecution is coming. And now we can see it. Now we can see that we are, we are, I, you know, we are literally possibly days away, weeks away from being able to say openly for priests to teach about what marriage is, to teach about what is moral, what is immoral. You know, it, and it's such a hypocrisy at, at this point in society because, you know, we have stop signs, stop lights, and so on, and we say it's immoral to break that, to go park in a handicap zone. Well, that's immoral, that's wrong, and you would be chastised for it. And rightly so, because we need these civil laws in order to keep order. But for some reason, to declare something immoral um, is, is now today considered to be hate speech. And as you said, Daniel, uh, this is, I think, also, I agree with you, I think this is the front, at least in the beginning, we're going to see, although, Daniel, we're already seeing the first signs right, we're uh, seeing it, yeah. of, of a and, violent persecution against the church, statues yeah. being hacked, churches yeah. being painted. It, it's not right. that far away behind what the courts are doing. And that's the thing. It's, it's that we are not spec... It, it's not just looking, oh, these are just isolated incidents of a few radicals decapitating statues. That would be tragic enough in its own right. It's that mainstream, powerful organizations are following the lead of these anarchists and these persecutors. They are bowing down before them, groveling before them in, in the midst of this movement today. So that is what's leading. You look at what they're doing, that's what society is about to do. And the thing is, we can't sink any lower than we've sunk today. You can't there is not a more obvious natural and divine truth than male and female. There's not. Right. When we can't even admit that, there's no lower to sink. And so when you take all of this collectively together, it really does, it's like a hurricane. It's just mm -hmm. one chaos after another leading to a point, a critical point. And as I said in the opening of this show, saints and mystics are calling it. They're saying <clears throat> we are coming to a point where there is going to be a, a great day of decision. A, God is going to pierce through in this generation. Atheists say he doesn't exist. After this great day, everyone Everyone will know that God exists, or at least they'll have an opportunity. They'll to have the at opportunity least, at least, right? That. Yeah. So unfortunately, <laughs> some will see. But as we get to the in the next webcast in the seventh seal, we'll talk about the aftermath of this great event we're about to introduce to you. But yeah, I suppose we should get to the event itself now in the sixth seal. That's right. So where we are now, we are coming to the sixth seal, and it is called the warning because that is also another term for it. So before we explain what this warning is, what this hour of decision that's coming, let's go to our website um, at Countdown to the Kingdom, and let's look at the seal um, that, that we're referring to. So once again, this is countdown to the kingdom.com. There you see the graphic that we're referring to. If you click it, you can zoom in and, and it's easier to read. And underneath that, you'll see these tabs that explain the entire timeline, by the way, that goes all the way to the second coming of Jesus in the flesh at the very end of time. But right now, we're turning right now to the sixth seal, the eye wall of the storm, this great storm that is already unfolding on the earth. And Daniel, uh, if you want to go ahead and read this sure. this warning, uh, that uh, and we'll explain why we are applying this in a moment, but this is yeah. what St. John saw. 
So here we are at the sixth seal. This is Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 to 17. Then I watched while he broke open the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. The sun turned as black as dark sackcloth, and the whole moon became like blood. The stars in the sky fell to the earth like unripe figs shaken loose from the tree in a strong wind. Then the sky was divided like a torn scroll curling up, and every mountain and island was moved from its place. The kings of the earth, the nobles, the military officers, the rich, the powerful, and every slave and free person hid themselves in the caves and among the mountain crags, and they cried out to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of the one who sits in the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. Because the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? Now, as I read that passage, it almost sounds like the final judgment that everyone believes, hey, this is it. Here's the Lamb. He's come. It's the final judgment. But clearly, just even a child can read the book of Revelation and what follows next. This is not the final judgment. It's not the end of the world. So the question is, what is this event in which people want to suddenly hide from God? Yeah. And before, you know, when I was reading the Bible many years ago, before I was kind of reading into prophecy and the signs of the times and the popes and everything, and I was confronted with the same confusion. What's going on here? This seems like the end of the world. We've got, we've got the sky being divided up. We've got, we, we've got everything coming apart. We, we've got something that seems like the end of the world, and yet it's clearly not, because look at how much more is still mm -hmm. to happen. So it seems like the end of the world, but it's not but it's the not. end of the world. And it, what happens at the end of the world? Is well, it, we know our creed. Right. What is it? <laughs> you know your creed. Jesus comes to judge the living to judge and the dead. The living and the dead. So judgment this seems day. like a judgment. People are wanting to hide, and they do say the great day of the wrath of the Lamb has come. But as we have explained, and we'll explain over and over again, the church fathers understood the day of the Lord not to be a single twenty-four hour day, but to be a great period of time. And so this event heralds the beginning of the day of the Lord in darkness, in the vigil. Just as Saturday night mass begins in darkness, it's the vigil of the day of the Lord. That's what we call the Saturday night, Saturday night mass. So too, the great day of the Lord, which comes in the end times, begins in darkness. It begins in the darkness of sin and evil and wickedness spreading through the world. And that eventually gives way to daylight. But we want to explain to you what this event is, and thanks be to God, we have many mystics and seers and saints who explain this event and shed light now on this chapter 6. Why don't we turn right now, Daniel, to, uh, well, to St. Faustina, because yeah. St. Faustina had a very clear vision of something happening, a warning of some kind given to mankind right, she says, before the last day, that is the day of the Lord. Right. Um, and we, some people misinterpret that to think, okay, this is, she must be talking about the very end of the world. But no, this is clearly a triumph of mercy in the world. The very right. last day is the triumph of justice. There's no more time for mercy at the very end. That's justice. So she's talking about a triumph of mercy here. And she's clearly referring by this last day, the more general understanding, scriptural fathers of the church of this great day of the Lord that Mark was just talking about. In number 83 of St. Faustina's diary, she describes this event that will come before that last day, the day of the Lord. She says, before I come, sorry, I should say Jesus says, he says, before I come as the just judge, I am coming first as the king of mercy. Before the day of justice arrives, there will be given to people a sign in the heavens of this sort. All light in the heavens will be extinguished and there will be a great darkness over the whole earth. Then the sign of the cross will be seen in the sky, and from the openings where the hands and the feet of the Savior were nailed, it will come forth great lights which will light up the earth for a period of time. This will take place shortly before the last day. She describes this, this event that people will see this cosmic event, something happening in the sky. Many other saints and seers, we want to tell you, we're not going to get into all the details here, 
past, but they speak of a great earthquake, a great shaking of the earth, which is remarkable because that's what he sees, St. John, in this in this this seal of, of chapter 6. There's a great shaking. The sky, he said, is rolled back. And this is what's interesting, Daniel, is they say that they see the Lamb. Now, if you roll back two chapters into chapter 4 Revelation, St. John also sees this Lamb and he describes him as a Lamb who seemed to have been slain. That is, Christ risen from the dead. And we remember Jesus showed up with his crucified wounds still in his resurrected body. And so what they're seeing is a vision of Jesus um, as if he was risen from the dead or, or just a cross. And maybe right now we should turn to another seer, Jennifer from America, who gives us another detailed version of this event. Um, she says in, in a message that she received over several times, and we've compiled it together, that the sky is dark, and this is what she saw in a vision, and it seems as though it is night, but my heart tells me it is sometime in the afternoon. I see the sky opening up, and I can hear long, drawn-out claps of thunder. When I look up, I see Jesus bleeding on the cross, and people are falling to their knees. Jesus then tells me they, were, they will see their soul as I see it. And I can see the wound so clearly on Jesus. And then he says, they will see each wound they have added to my most sacred heart. Daniel, at this point, we're getting a bit of a preview as to exactly what this event is and why the people in the book of Revelation were beginning to want to hide themselves. Right, because when you look at the how deeply the world is mired in sin with this warning hits, the amount that souls alive today have contributed to the passion of our Lord. The amount that they've contributed to the scourging, to his carrying of the cross, to his being nailed to the cross, they will see all of that in the warning, and they will not be able to bear the sight of it, so many people. So they would prefer the very mountains to fall on them than to have to bear the sight of their soul as God sees it, and yet they will have to see it. And it will be a great mercy that they will be given this site. Some seers, such as Father uh, Stefano Gobi, whose writings have the imprimatur, he says that this will be um, a judgment in miniature. Uh, Blessed Anna Mary Tagi, uh, Tagi, that's a Japanese name, I believe, um, she, she sees it as an illumination of conscience. I think you have that quote in front of you. Yeah, I have this one right here. She, was, she said, a great purification will come upon the world preceded by an illumination of conscience in which everyone will see themselves as God sees them. So in this illumination, as in many judgment, there, is, there are no more defenses. You see your soul, yourself, as God sees it. Most people are not ready for that. We hope to prepare you for that moment in these webcasts, but we, we also want to convince you that this is indeed coming. We, want, we don't want you to have any doubts remaining in your mind, and there's so many other mystics that have mentioned this, even all the way back to the 1500s. We've got St. Edmund Canby and a Jesuit saint. He says, he, he, he says very clearly in his writings, I pronounced a great day wherein the terrible judge should reveal all men's consciences mm -hmm. and try every man of each kind of religion. He is the one who mentioned it, who referred to this as the day of change. This is, a par this is the quintessential paradigm shift. This is a once in a creation event. I've also heard it referred to as. This will change everything. Mm -hmm. So it's very fitting to call it the day of change. But we also have so many more, and we can't go through all of them here, but the seer of Heed, Germany. This is a approved apparition. It says the earth will tremble. And I'm taking some of these quotes, by the way, from Christine Watkins' book in the warning. That the earth will tremble. A mini judgment. There will be a mini judgment. But do not fear. Remember, that's our overarching message here. Be not afraid. You need not be afraid of anything if you trust in the divine mercy. Now, I want to just jump in there too. Do jump in, please. And talk about what what is this? What exactly does this look like to to be as if you were standing before God in, in, in your own hour of judgment. In St. Faustina, elsewhere in her diary, gives a, a, a beautiful description. She says that suddenly, I saw the complete condition of my soul as God sees it. I could clearly see all that is displeasing to God. I did not know that even the smallest transgressions will have to be accounted for. 
What a moment! Who can describe it? To stand before the thrice holy God. You know, I've met several people who have already had this experience, and I, I think God has given us souls like this as kind of a pre-warning to the warning. One woman said to me that she she saw had the, this illumination of conscience. She she wasn't in a car accident or anything, and you know, often people who are in accidents, their whole life flashes before them, and this is kind of what this illumination is. But the Lord, in a moment, gave her to see her soul and the condition it was. You know, she said to me, Daniel, that she cried for two weeks straight. It was just stunning what she saw, but it was life-changing, as you, as you've been, I think, rightly yeah, saying. That sounds pretty accurate be, be, regarding how the warning is going to affect people. We'll get into all the details of what will take place after the warning in the next webcast. But this, you can't imagine mm -hmm. right now unless you have experienced a warning yourself. And I, I haven't. I'm going by what the mystics have said. The sight of your sins as God sees them, because we are so easy on ourselves, aren't we? Hmm. We think, oh, it's okay that I said that. Oh, it's okay that I did that. Oh, it's okay that I didn't do that other thing. Whatever God understands. Well, that's exactly the problem. He does understand. <laughs> he understands perfectly. He understands that you chose your self-will over his will. He understands that you ignored him in that point, even though you knew full well what he wanted of you and you didn't do it. He understands perfectly, and you're going to see all of that. You know, the there morning. was a... Sorry, I'm sorry. Cut you off a bit. No uh, problem. There's a message on our website, and uh, Daniel, do you recall uh, Gisela Cardia from Italy? And the Lord mm -hmm. said something about... Uh, it was about taking his mercy for granted. Do you remember the, the exact yes. words? Yes, and I don't remember the exact words, but I think I can paraphrase it well enough. And l please look up Gisela Cardia's uh, messages. They're amazing. We, yeah, we put yeah. them on Countdown to the Kingdom. They are such a consolidated overview of what's coming. Very powerful messages. But she's, the, the message was basically, woe to those in this day who speak only of my mercy and forget that I am also justice. Mm -hmm. Yes, Divine mercy is his greatest attribute. Don't get me wrong. The biggest problem would be to neglect that. But it's also a big problem to neglect his justice. As I said in the last webcast, he is absolutely both. He is never unbalanced. There is no mercy if there is no justice. Right. They're, they, they're always hand in hand. They have to be. So, yeah, and, and and we're gonna we're gonna see both sides of the coin completely in this warning. It is the greatest. This is the irony of it, and yet it's such a perfect irony with God, because it's the greatest act of mercy in history, and yet we will he will also reveal his justice in more clarity than ever before in history. So yes, it's a bit paradoxical, but thanks be to God it's coming, because boy, does the world need it right now, doesn't oh, it? It does. You know, the great Catholic mystic uh, spiritual daughter to St. Pio, servant of God Maria Esperanza, she said mm -hmm. that the consciences of these beloved people must be violently shaken so that they may put their house in order. A great moment is approaching, a great day of light. It is the hour of decision for mankind. The I mean, that's decision. kind of the summary of what this sixth seal is, this great the day of, of light decision, that will yeah. flow from the cross. And, you know, you heard Jennifer, her version of seeing it was actually seeing Jesus on the cross. And, you know, we just want to point out that these seers aren't contradicting each other, but each of them is given, I always think of it as like a house, right? Uh, each seer gets to, uh, looks through a house and through a different window, and they get a different picture of different events. Right. And when you put the consensus together, you, you get a beautiful picture. So, you know, maybe some people will only see the cross. Maybe others will mm -hmm. see Jesus crucified. You know, we don't, we don't know, and we're not Yeah, here and there's so many details. details. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up, because inevitably, I've been talking about this, and Mark has been talking about this for a long time, and, and some people just flood you with questions. They need to know all the details. What about this part? What about, okay, they, they want to know every single little thing about it. We don't know. The mystics themselves don't know, nor does it matter. You need to know the gist of what's coming so that you can prepare for what's coming, which is why we're doing this, not to just arbitrarily inform you about what's coming, but so that you can prepare appropriately for it. And I think you've already grasped quite well, just from the quotes that we've shared so far, what the gist of this is. So preparing for it is very straightforward, isn't it? It's not. Um, it's certainly not about stockpiling food or, or, or guns or anything like that. That won't protect you from God's justice. It's about spiritually preparing your soul, purifying it 
as much as possible now. Above all, with the sacrament of confession, repent, which requires repentance, with consecrating yourself to Our Lady, to the Holy Family, praying the Rosary, trusting in the Divine Mercy, striving to live in the Divine Will. The point of the message we're sharing with you now is to give you encouragement to do those things. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that will prepare you for the warning. And, you know, at this point, when we, we talk about this being a warning, uh, it, we, you know, you see we are, we are kind of this major moment. It, you've just heard different mystics and seers and saints telling you about this. Um, it's in Scripture, I believe, as well. We're, we're, um, and I forget the, the writer, Daniel, maybe you'll recall, who says that they will look upon him whom they have pierced. And they will that sounds it. like Isaiah to me, but are you talking about in Scripture itself? It does, and I think there's a double mm -hmm. meaning. I think it's also, you know, the people who crucified Jesus looking upon him, but, mm -hmm. but it, there's also different layers to Scriptures, and I think that that does come into play again in the warning. And as Jennifer said, people yes. will see the wounds they've created in his sacred heart. Right. Yeah, and that's the key to remember in Scripture in general is that a given verse prophesying one thing does not exclude other layers to that same verse so it's so important to remember that and there's you know so we don't we don't have time to go through all the rest of the ones i have on here but we should we do need to at least quickly mention that this is probably most often referred to as the warning and where does that come from well, that comes from the apparitions of garabandel which i i believe are authentic right yeah. and that's you know tons of information about the warning comes yeah. also from garabandel that those where, words the warning was actually coined at garabandel right exactly okay. Even though she's, the, that's far from the earliest prophecy of it, it's one of the major prophecies of, the, uh, of this event. The most important thing is that everyone in the world will see, assign a grace, and find themselves alone in the world, no matter where they are at that time, alone with their consciences right before God. Hmm. Again, like a mini judgment day. Whatever you know about judgment day, or I should say specifically your your particular judgment, because at the warning you won't be standing there with all souls past with with all souls who have ever lived. That will be the general judgment. The warning will be you and God. So it's more like your particular judgment, but still with great you know great references to Judgment Day, as as we mentioned earlier. Whatever you can think about that judgment, it's going to apply in large part to the warning, most likely. So, whatever you would do to prepare for Judgment Day, do it to prepare for the warning. You know, I would like to maybe at this point just share um, an analogy, and it's a biblical one, of the prodigal son, because I, I, I really think that this is the moment that is coming for the world. I mean, you all, if probably most of you watching this have heard the story, but Jesus tells a parable where this son wants to leave his father's house. He, he, he doesn't want anything to do with him anymore. And he says boldly to the father, I want my half of the inheritance. I mean, that's pretty extraordinary to say that to your living father. But the father does. He, he doesn't want to hold back his son. If you don't want to live in my house, he says, fine. So he lets the boy go. And now the rest of the story, most of you know it. I mean, the boy took his money and he spent it on fast women and fast camels. And, you know, he blew the wad and he went broke. So there's economic collapse. Then it says there was a famine that hit the land. There you have the fourth seal. He still didn't come home. You see, this is a stubborn boy, and we are a stubborn generation. Now, as the story goes, Jesus says that the boy finally, he's so hungry, he go. now he's, he's a Jewish boy. This is the parable. He goes to feed pigs. And that is the worst job that a Jewish boy could do. But it was there. In that moment where he realizes that the pigs are eating better than him. In this moment of dysfunction and chaos, in the eye wall of the storm of his life, he has an illumination of conscience. The boy falls to his knees and he says, why did I leave my father's house? And he says, I'm no longer worthy to be called a son. I'm just a servant. And that's what I'll tell him. And so he gets up and he goes home. He starts heading home, and the rest of the story is incredible because Jesus tells us what happens next, is that the Father sees him coming from a long way off. That means the Father was watching. He was waiting for the boy to return, and I tell you right now, the Father in heaven has his eyes right now on a abortionists. He has his eye on pornographers. He has his eyes on crooks and criminals. You see, Jesus didn't come for the healthy. He said, I came for the sick. 
And so this day of warning, this day of mercy, and we're going to close by telling you why this is so important. But we want to just say now, this day of mercy is to call home especially those who are furthest away from the Father. And so it says that the Father saw him coming from a long way off and he ran to the boy and he hugged him and he kissed him. And I don't know about you, Daniel, but I've been around pigs. I've been around pig pans. I've smelt them. Two minutes in, in a pig pen, and you, your clothes will smell like it all day long. I believe you. The fight, yeah, you, yeah. Just take my word for it. I will. So, so the father runs to him and he hugs him. Now, of course, the Jewish listeners know this, and they see him kiss the boy. You see, that's this story is contrary to the way that fathers would deal with their boys in those times. It was, it was strict. It was, you know, you're out on your ear, you're on your own kind of thing. But the father takes him back. My son was lost, but now he's fine. He was blind, but now he sees. So in the seventh seal, which will be our next webcast, we're going to explain to you some of the gifts and graces that are going to happen during the following eye of the storm. Because, yeah, because you need to be ready to be mm -hmm. the one to help people to make the same transition that the prodigal son did. Mm -hmm. Because that is the moment for the greatest harvest of souls in history you need to be ready for that moment and when that moment comes you need to respond to it well there are going to be so many people everybody will have received the warning but they will be in this time of decision you need to reach them in that time of decision and lead them back to the heavenly father who's ready with open arms he's even watching as mark said but they're still going to need that help and you who know what's coming you are going to be that help. You are going to be the ones to reap the greatest harvest of souls in history. We have to save the details of that for the next webcast, because now we want to focus just on the morning itself, just in the sixth seal itself. I want to I want to bring up there's an analogy on my heart right now. I've got to I've got to say this, because right now, Daniel, you're you're giving people the right focus. You know, a lot of Christians were, were disturbed by what we're seeing, and we should be. We should be disturbed, but but we can also look at people and start to 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 judge and label and 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 Jesus said, "Do not judge people." I mean, there's a reason for it. You know, a lot of people have wounds and there's things and they're acting out in ways, or or they're ignorant of Christ. I mean, as we have said in previous webcasts, the great vacuum in the world, the spiritual vacuum, is the fault primarily of the church, and I take blame for that too. It's been created by the church, so when we start pointing fingers at the evil people out there, how many people have we evangelized in the last year? I mean, I think that just kind of answers the question. So, what I want to point out is one more quick analogy. There's a movie called Lord of the Rings, and these boys get, sorry, Lord of the Flies, <laughs> yeah, I love Lord of the Rings, too. But Lord of the Flies is a, is a movie that came out many years ago. And in this movie, these boys are shipwrecked on this island. So they, they have to start making do on the island. And as they do, they start forming kind of tribal groups and so on. And they go from being very civilized school, you know, school boys and school uniforms and everything to basically being kind of these tribal boys. And it just totally breaks down to the point where they're beginning to hunt and murder each other because of their hatred and division. It, what you're seeing behind me right now is a... It's an icon of what is happening right now in the streets of many cities throughout the world as this global revolution spreads, the hatreds, the divisions. But look, don't focus on this. Listen, what comes next in the movie, and I'm sorry this is a spoiler, but... There comes a point where the boy, one boy, one of the, the leaders who, who is now rejected by all of them, he's running from them. They're fleeing after him with spears. And he runs to the beach and he, he mm -hmm. trips and he falls down. And, and the camera kind of widens out and you see he's looking down at the boots of a, uh, of a, of a Navy SEAL. Mm. And this, so, yeah. this soldier's I, look, looking down at him, right? And it, Suddenly, order is yeah. reintroduced. Authority is reintroduced into a scenario that had rejected. That's right. it. All the boys run out of the bush, yeah. right? And they're coming. And and this 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 navy, you know, seal. He looks at the boys coming out of the bush, you know, and they're all you know, they're covered in makeup and filthy. And he looks at the boy then, who's crying now on the beach, and he just looks at them. And he goes, "What what are you doing?" Mm. And when I saw that, 
that to me is the it's the moment of illumination of conscience yeah. all the, of the radical stuff we're seeing the violence the hatred the the racism the reverse racism that's taking place now all of this is going to come to a stop a, dead a screeching stop. halt oh, it'll yeah. be the Just day of silence yeah. <laughs> yeah it's and i didn't watch i didn't know there was a movie i i, I had to read the book in in the school as right. a kid and i still it's funny you bring that up now. We hadn't talked about this before at all, but I vividly recall that particular scene, mm -hmm. and it seemed powerful and almost prophetic. And you just brought that up now, and I think it is a beautiful analogy. And it also reminds me of the final scene in Mel Gibson's movie Apocalypto, mm -hmm. where Christianity, at the very end of the movie, is suddenly brought onto the shores. Well, goodness, the world has forgotten Christ. We are just as pagan as we've ever been, even if we're nominally Christian in many parts of the world. We're not in truth. Christ is going to reintroduce himself into the world like never before, miraculously, cosmically, a divine intervention like the world has never seen. It is going to bring us all to a screeching halt. You know, you might wonder why, why didn't he just do this before? You know, why, mm -hmm. why isn't there a warning every few years? That'd be great. Well, look, yeah. we need it now. This is a once in a creation event. We need it now like we've never needed it before. A as a philosopher, I, I hate to have to admit this, but we can't logically, philosophically argue society back into sanity. We can't do it. And do, no, don't stop trying to do your best to no, refute error right, and to evangelize now. Keep doing your best because hopefully you'll save many individual souls that way. But we're not going to restore society that way. I'm sorry to break it to you. We need cause. We need Jesus yeah. to directly intervene. Daniel, that's, and that's the, exactly that's, what it's going to do. That's a word. I, you know, I, I was praying one day and I sensed the Lord say that this is what is needed now. A mm -hmm. cosmic surgery that when cancer metastasizes there's no way to cure it other than by a divine intervention a miracle and this is where we are you're absolutely right and this is why we are emphasizing how important this is this warning that is coming and this is how we're gonna we're gonna wrap this up this warning that is coming you have to understand it is a warning that precedes the cleansing and purification of the entire world and this is why it's jesus is doing it now he didn't do it a thousand years ago he didn't do it a hundred years ago it's because he has tried as we, we've said in previous webcasts he's tried to bring us by mercy he's tried to bring us to an air of peace by love he's tried to bring us by teasing us with his mother and with his, the messages that's the heart of jesus who wishes to press he said aching mankind to his heart and that he said to St. Faustina, I do not wish to take up the sword of justice, but it's only when humanity forces me to do so that I must. And that's why this warning is coming. It's to say to humanity, you have reached the point of no return. And you have to come back to me, all who want to. This will be a great sifting. And we'll explain this a little bit more in the next webcast, but this really is a moment, the hour of decision. As you said, Dan, at one point, there's no more fence to sit on. It's The Lord is going to yeah. shake it, you know? That's, yeah. Yeah. You don't want to be in a picket it, fence it, when it's shaking. Sitting, Ouch. yeah. You don't, want to, you don't want to sit in there, that's for sure. <laughs> and, you know, the other analogy I like to draw is sitting on a fence only allows the dog in either yard to bite you. There's no benefit to sitting on a fence at all. So right. choose a side right now and just go on it because whatever side you choose, it's better than the fence. Now, I hope you choose wisely and choose the side of Christ because blessed are all those who believe in even though they have not seen, as our mm -hmm. Lord said in the gospel. It is going to be so much better for you if you choose him now instead of waiting for the warning to, to do it much more painfully. Not that not a, not even the warning won't override your free will. Even then, it'll have to be a choice how you respond. But it'll be so much better to choose him now, to repent now. So how do you best prepare? We've already said the, the general items. But do we have time to make a brief exhortation to our listeners regarding general confession? Yeah, I, I think we, 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 we need to give... We should bring that you, you up, You need yeah. to hear some practical things. And... We want you to take this serious. This is a great gift, a great, as Jesus said to St. Faustina, before the day of justice, I'm giving you the day of mercy. There is no sin, Jesus has said to St. Faustina, no sin so dark, so black, so red, so scarlet, that he will not take it away. And so this webcast is already for you a warning before the warning. 
it, it's but well, we don't want to. I don't want to call it a warning. This is a moment of where we are saying to you as brothers in Christ, turn to Jesus now. You know, you know your sins. We don't have to sit here and tell you. You know what is wrong in your life. You know where you're out of line with the gospel. Even though you, many of you who are watching this may not even read the Bible, but you, you have a thing in you called your conscience. There's a thing called the natural law. And you know when you're against that grain. And these are things that, to bring to God and to say to Him, Lord, I have lived long enough without you. It's time for me to come back to you before this warning. Because I don't want to... You know, I just want to say this is, is a loving warning. Some of the mystics and seers have said that those who... Some people who aren't prepared for this will be so shocked... Like just what you heard in Revelation chapter six, that they they want to hide right under the in the caves and under the crags and the rocks, they'll be so shocked that some will die from fright. Daniel and again, I'm not saying this to scare anybody, but um, that this is how grave this warning is for mankind. And so what we're saying is right now, turn to Jesus, because if you take a sin right now to our Lord and you ask him to forgive you for something from the past, when the illumination of conscience comes. You may see that sin again, but you know what? You're going to see it in the light of mercy. You're going to see how you responded to it. In fact, some of the mystics have said, those who are living in grace, those who are walking with the Lord, that this time of warning is actually going to strengthen them. And in, and in the seventh seal, we're going to explain to you the gifts and graces that will be poured out, I think, for those who are ready. Those who aren't ready are going to have, it, kind of like Pentecost. At Pentecost, the apostles were ready to receive, but mm -hmm. then they had to go out and preach and get people ready who weren't ready. And right. so this is kind of what's coming. Yeah, there's going to be a few different categories of responses to the warning. There, as Mark said, unfortunately, there will be those so shocked that it will kill mm -hmm. them. Yeah. And I hope that's a very small percentage. I think it will be a very small percentage because this is primarily a mercy. The vast majority of people will be so shocked they will be in a state of annihilation. They will feel just completely undone. They will have, they will be they will need your help. But in order to be that help, you need to be ready for the warning by, as Mark said, bringing all your sins to our Lord. And guess what? What that really means? Yes, do it right now between you and God. But what that really urgently means is go to confession all your sins yeah. you need to lay them out there before the priest there are some sins that you are so embarrassed about that you've been afraid to say them so far to the priest say them yeah he's not going to sit tell anyone he is bound by secrecy he will die before revealing your sins and i know how sorry of a state the church is in i know how i know how much sin and error has invaded the priesthood but there are very few priests out there who would break the seal of confessional I know they exist, but they're very few and far between. So don't worry about that. Yeah. You're, who, even if you don't like your parish priest, I, I am convinced he will die before revealing your <laughs> sins. He's not going to tell anyone. And guess what? He doesn't care anyway. He's I, heard it before. I don't care how everything. gross your sins are. <laughs> He's heard it many times before. Heard He's everything. not going to tell anyone. He doesn't care. He's going to probably fall asleep while you're saying them. And it doesn't matter if he falls asleep because he's acting in persona Christi. When he says, I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, he's not saying that. Jesus is, and your sins are annihilated when he says that, those, as those long as you've are, held nothing back. Those of you who are Protestant are listening and going, well, well, I don't need to go to a priest. Well, no, it's true. You can confess your sins to your hairdresser, your taxi cab driver, or your pillow. But the We all confess is, to someone. That's right. You can confess to them, but they do not have the power to forgive your sins. When Jesus entered the upper room after his resurrection, he breathed on the twelve apostles, and he said to them, you, uh, he said, hey, breathe on them and said, peace I leave with you. Whoever sins you forgive are forgiven. Whoever sins you bind are bound. So the power to forgive was given. That retaining and that loosing of sin was given to the apostles and to their successors until this day. That's why we Catholics confess to priests, because they were given the authority by Christ. And in confession, you know, there are graces given to you as well. This is why, as Catholics, we also confess our venial sins. Those are the, the smaller, as you, if you want to call it, if you may, the smaller sins that aren't sins that break friendship with God. So, you know, you might lose your temper during the day by accident. You didn't plan on it. You know, that doesn't break friendship with God. It doesn't break grace, you know, sanctifying grace. You don't lose that. 
you know, it's the mortal sins, the great sins like murder and adultery and so on that do place your eternal soul in jeopardy according to St. Paul in the scriptures. So and you've got to bring those to before our Lord. That's because right. Because if you're hiding something to, from the past, yeah. I'm sorry, Daniel. I was going to say, no, if you're continue. hiding something from the past, you know, if you're ashamed of it, you've been hiding it. It's a secret and you're so ashamed of it. This is the time because during the illumination, it will come out because God knows it already. You can't hide it from God. If He's mercy and He knows it already, why are you hiding it from right. Him? Right. And you know what you can do? If you're really just too afraid to get to say this to your parish priest, well, drive somewhere. Look up mass times two hours from you. Drive there. Confess your sins in a weird voice. Wear a, I don't wear a mask. Everybody's wearing a mask today anyway. Whatever you have to do to get yourself to confession, do it. It's okay. I don't recommend any of that because it's pointless, but you can if you really feel like you have to. Just get to confession. Confess all your sins. You have to confess all your mortal sins. You have to. Mm -hmm. There's no option. You have to confess all your mortal sins, and when you do, they're gone. They're annihilated. Go on. You need to trust that because it's a promise of our Lord Himself. You know, I read a psychologist several years ago, Daniel, who said, he said, I'm not a Catholic, and I'm, I'm not saying I support the Catholic Church, but what happens in the confessional in the Catholic Church, that is what we try and do in our offices as psychologists. 90% of the healing of our clients comes through them just confessing their sins. Mm. I also read a study of um, police who were saying that they leave cold cases, murder cases, they'll leave them open for decades sometimes because they know this about human nature that we have to confess. And they said that somewhere, in some prison, some moment, some murderer will often, he'll befriend somebody, he'll gain their trust, and he just has to tell them. And so they have often solved cold cases because these kinds of things happen. They just have to get it off their chest. Well, you see, Jesus is the great psychologist. He knows that we need to confess our sins. That's why he gave us the sacrament. I also think that's why he gave us the Eucharist because he knew we needed to touch him. And well, I'll talk about that another day. But, y you know, we want to maybe just close by, by suggesting a general confession for those of you who haven't done it. A general confession is this where you just reflect, you do an examination of conscience of your whole life. And often you may find sins that you, you forgot to confess or you never did confess. And it's to bring these things before the Lord and to ask Him to forgive every sin in your life. It is, I've done it, Daniel has done it, it is so healing. If you've already done it, you don't need to do it again. It's done, because you need to trust in yeah. Jesus now. You don't want to get scrupulous. That would be even worse. You, we don't, that would be distrusting His mercy, That's which right. is never what we want to fall into. We want absolute trust in His mercy. But if you haven't, if there are sins you haven't confessed, if you've never done a general confession, now, now would be a good time. And you might really want to enlist the aid of an examination of conscience. It's an actual formal examination of conscience. I'd recommend that, because... We are so misled today into thinking that so many things we do are okay when they're not. We are, we are, we, in the modern church and in the modern world, we tend to think that things that are mortal are venial. We tend to think that things that are venial aren't sins at all, and they are. And look, I, I have to be blunt here. Any uh, use of the sexual faculty outside of marriage, that's mortal. You need to bring that to confession. And that is so pervasive today that I just had to mention that sin specifically. You need to get that absolved. And it's very easy for Jesus to absolve sins of weakness, but you have to bring them to him yeah. through the priest. So please look up an examination of conscience. Honestly, I recommend hopping on Google and typing in traditional Catholic examination of conscience because so the, the right traditional kind. ones tend to be a little more rigorous and we need to honest. be rigorous with ourselves and honest. Yeah. Yeah. Not scrupulous, but, but rigorous. Pius XII said in a radio interview, the sin of the century is the loss of the sense of sin. And right. we see that all around us. And that's why we are coming to this great point of a warning in the world. This is a great mercy. This is the moment when the prodigal sons and daughters are going to come home. We're going to talk about that in the seventh seal, about this great grace that's coming, that will God will give, this opportunity. You know, I just want to say this one last thing. Many of our parents, Daniel, are worried about their kids. You get letters, I get letters. Their grandkids, they left home. When God looked at the world and was about to cleanse the world, as He's about to do again, not by a flood this time, but he will cleanse it again. When God looked at the world, 
he said, I see no righteous souls except for you, Noah. But when the flood came, God saved Noah and his family. So what I'm saying is those of you who are watching, who are worried about your kids, worried about them, that they, how do I tell them about the warning and so on? Well, you can share this webcast with them. They may or may not be open to it. But here's the thing. You be Noah. You be the righteous one in your family. You be the one standing in the gap like Moses, interceding, praying for them. And I believe by doing that, you are going to be heaping up graces for them that God will give them when this universal warning comes. And folks, we feel it is coming soon. We aren't going to set dates or predictions. But what we will say is we're hearing a prophetic consensus emerging that towards this fall, that things are escalating and are going to escalate in the world. And because of this escalation, it could bring us to the warning very quickly. We don't know. It could be five years from now. I, I have no idea. The point is, is you need to be ready to go home tonight. You need and be to be excited about it. Be excited Don't be about afraid. Going home this tonight. is the most exciting time in history to live in. The greatest act of mercy is going to be given to the whole world. You too will experience it. I think you will. Now, yes, it might hurt. Don't be afraid of pain. Pain is not something to be afraid of. This is above all a grace such an exciting grace. Everything is going to change. And look, not just the world is in need of it, not just the church is in need of it. Guess what else? Guess who else is in need of it? I'm in need of it. Maybe you are also, because I'm a knucklehead. As I've said before, I'm full of all sorts of vices that I haven't found the strength to get over yet. Oh, thank I'm God. not I as holy as me. I should be. It's, <laughs> it is only you. I'm just joking. It's only you, Mark. No, but it's because you know, I need the help that the warnings that I know the warning will give me. So I'm excited. Yeah. I, I'm not putting off my holy, my striving after holiness until then. Don't ever put off anything until the warning, because again, we don't know timetables. So do everything you can now, but be excited for the warning. It's going to give the world what it needs. It's going to give the church what it needs, and it's going to give you, and me, and Mark what we need. Thanks be to God. Be excited. That's right. After the sixth seal, then comes the seventh seal, a time of reprieve, a time that is a calm in the storm. It is an hour for the prodigal sons and daughters to return home. It's an hour, a great awakening, but it will also be an hour when Satan will also make his moves because he knows this is coming as well. We're going to explain to you also in our next webcast that uh, temptation, the counterfeit that is coming, how Satan is going to mimic this, mock it, discredit it. And so we want you to be ready for that too. But this, I think we've left you with enough for now yeah. to get ready Preparing for, this for the warning. Because right after the warning, you got to hit the ground running. Yeah. And you've got to be ready to do, you got to know what you need to do. So in the next webcast, we will tell you what you need to be ready to do at that point, the moment the warning is over. This is a message of great hope. Try and spread it, spread it to people. And look, if people don't want to, they delete it, you know, just love them. Respond in love to them and say, okay, just thought you might be interested. And then pray and fast for them. You know, the last thing I want to close with is just to say this, that after you've gone to confession, you know, Jesus said you can sweep the house clean. But if you don't fill the house, seven demons worse, he said, will come and occupy the house. So we want to recommend to you, if you are listening to this, if you haven't been to confession for 40 or 50 years, if this is a return for you already as a prodigal son and daughter, don't forget to fill the house. Start going back to Mass where you can. Receive Jesus, who is present in the Holy Eucharist. Pick up your Bible, which is the Word of, of God, and fill your heart with His Word, which is living. Also, um, fast and pray. And in these ways, you will begin to fill the house. Pray, pray, pray. Begin to pray every day. Turn off that TV. Turn off social media. Spend time with God. Fill the house. Because if you do this now, when the warning comes, you're going to be one You'll of those who are going to be yes. helping people. Amen. All right. Thank you for watching. On behalf of everyone at Countdown of the Kingdom, God bless you, and we'll see you next time. God bless you.